Good everyone, all today's video, and today we have a bit of a guide, shall we say? This is more of a tips and guide tutorial on transitioning to ARB. This isn't something I typically do, however, it's for one of my oldest subs, and I think it's the least I can do by giving it a shot and going into as much detail as I can in one video about transitioning from Air Arcade to Air RB. Now, as you can tell by the video's length, this is going to be a big one. So if I was you, I would grab a snack, a drink, and just sit back, relax, and if you're maybe an experienced pilot, you might learn some of it. So, this is for one of my oldest subs, named Neb2007. I hope I'm saying that right. And he's been really struggling from getting into, well, transitioning from Air Arcade to Air RB. Now, of course, I can't cover everything in one video. That would take far too long. And to be brutally honest, I just don't see the point in doing it in all in one video anyway. So we're going to be covering the basics. We're going to be covering the more, shall we say, slightly advanced stuff. But also we're going to be doing a separate video, if you want me to, of more advanced stuff. Now I have quite a big list and um, this is going to require a lot of time on your end. So if you have about, well, depends on how long I can edit it down because I might be able just to shave off a few minutes. Um, I'd recommend sitting down for about 20, 25 minutes, maybe even half an hour. depends on how much I can edit out and just enjoy this, shall we say, look into how to transition from Air Arcade to Air RB, at least in my eyes. So, tip number one, learn your aircraft. This is the most vital thing that I can suggest about Air RB. Now, here I have the LA-7B20. You're going to be seeing this plane throughout, the, throughout this video, by the way, because I have a couple of examples to show you with this aircraft. Um, and the key to learning your aircraft Apart from knowing the basics like what guns it has, what's its top speed, things like that, it's a bit different in Air RB. In Air Arcade, sure, you have boosted climb rates, you have boosted turn rates, you have boosted roll rates in some cases, and the controls are far lighter than what they should be. But that's Arcade. RB is meant to be a realistic scenario, somewhat for the aircraft's performance and handling. If I was to take this LA-7 into Air AB, it would handle a lot differently from what I'm used to in Air Realistic. That is one of the most important steps of learning your aircraft. What's its rip speed? What speed does your aircraft tear itself apart from overspeed? What about its climb rate? Maybe your aircraft climbs at a certain angle at a certain speed better than another aircraft. And maybe you could use that to your advantage if you fight one. What speed does its controls stiffen up? Like the rudder, the elevator, the ailerons, etc. And most importantly, what aircraft, well, what aircraft will you be fighting that your aircraft can potentially beat or not beat? Because at the end of the day, you are always going to find a counter for your aircraft. It's kind of like the food chain. You'll always have an animal that's bigger than the biggest animal on the block. For example, you've got stuff like, well, you'd have something like, I don't know, a crab, and then you'd just have something like, I don't know, a seal. The seal's bigger than the crab, but then the shark's bigger than the seal. You get my point. So, of course, that is the best way to learn about your aircraft. Learn what it can do, learn what it can't do, even if it takes you a few, or shall we say, a handful of matches. You aren't going to get everything first time. And that is the most important thing. As one of my most favorite things to say is, the best learning tool is a mistake. That's what you guys need to focus on. And if you're transitioning from Air Arcade to Air RB, this is the most important topic. Learning from your mistakes is the best way. So tip number two, knowing your enemy. Now this can be quite 
subjective. It depends on what you're fighting and the player you are fighting. Now, of course, you can do what I do and go take a look at an average player's player card. Now, of course, I'm not an average player. Just saying that right now, but I'm just using my player card for this example. You can look at their level. Now, level doesn't always indicate skill. Trust me, I've seen some dog shit level 100s. But this can give you a good indication of how long they've played the game and potentially what tricks they could use against you. This is important. You can also look at the player's service record in Re Air Realistic. Obviously, I fly all different sorts and I play all different sorts, but if I just turn off tanks for this example, because we're not discussing tanks today, you'll notice, yeah, I'm a bit rusty with my Russians, like Mayak 9T, but I use that a lot in Crown Force, so you can understand that. But overall, I'm not bad in Russia. I could, I could be better, to be brutally honest, but if you ever see me in a Russian plane, chances are you might actually have an edge. This is a good advantage to have. You can look at your opponent and think, hmm, he's good in this plane, but he might not be good in the one I'm currently fighting. This also applies to certain types of aircraft. Now, of course, you can stuff a noob in a jet and it won't go well for them, but you still need to know what you're fighting. So my best suggestion is to spread out your tech trees. Of course, this is a world win. This doesn't count for this video. But you can spread out your tech trees by playing all the different nations. Maybe if you're noob to the game and you're struggling with the BF1 and E3, you're not sure how to fight this thing, fly it. That's the best piece of advice I can give. If you're not sure how to beat an opponent, well, an opponent's aircraft, fly it yourself. Go into that specific tech tree. For example, the BF1 and E3 is right here. Obviously, it's in tab with E4, but still. And then you can learn its strengths, its weaknesses, and you can use those weaknesses to your advantage. This will take time. And I know this sounds like a lot of effort to put in, but trust me, this will make you a far better player if you do this. This also applies to Air AB, but obviously we're doing this in RB, so it's a little bit different. And this is so important. Playing all the different tech trees, because I've played every single one of these. I've played US, Germany, all that, all the way up the jets. I have every single prop spaded other than the TU4s. So there's a lot to learn here. And sure, I might jump into a plane like the P61 and be a bit rusty, but it won't take me long to get back into the swing of things with it. And that's the most important thing. If you can't defeat a P61, learn its strengths and learn its weaknesses by going down the line and playing it yourself. That's one of the most important things. Now for the next tip, we're going to be going into a replay with the LA-7. This is going to be about energy state. This is a bit more advanced, so if you're not quite sure about how to pull this sort of thing off, this might take some tries for you. But don't worry, I'll try and cover it as best I can. So I'm going to jump into the replay and I'm going to skip ahead to the part of the battle that's relevant. I'll see you all in a minute. So you now join me in the replay. This is going to be about the energy state, as I've already stated. That was kind of a pun, wasn't it? And this is going to cover a dogfight that I had. So I've saved this replay just for this video. Now, I'm going to pause it right here and just go to the free camera. As you can see, I'm doing 304 miles an hour. These two down here, this Typhoon and this P-51, have just engaged a PEA and shot it down. If we look at their aircraft, if I just find the right players... 149 miles an hour, this guy's nearing stall speed. And if we look at... where's the Typhoon? I don't know his username. There he is. He's also at very low energy. And here's me. Now obviously, I could already guess that these guys are already at low speed. So this is where I take my advantage. As you can see, their aircraft are going very slow and they're really struggling to maneuver. 
This is where I'm going to force the fight to my advantage. I fire a burst at the Mustang to force him to break off. And then I start maneuvering because there's two of them and there's one of me. Now using the energy state that I picked up in the dive, I'm able to swing the, the LA-7 around and start forcing it into my favor. Now of course, the Typhoon is low on energy. So I'm able to kill him easily by forcing him into a stall turn. But of course, now I'm low on speed and the Mustang started to pick up. So I throw the plane around and now I know roughly that the P-51 is at about the same speed as me. Why do I know this? Well, he's turning with me. Mustangs only turn when they have a good bit of speed behind them. However, now he's just taking a crit. So now his aircraft is going to be handling much worse than it originally was. This is where the Mustang does the right thing and dives away. This is the only thing you can really do in this scenario. So I fire a burst, I get another hit, but then he runs with his tail between his legs and goes away. Now again, I'm going to jump us ahead a little bit further into the battle. Because again, we have a bit more to cover. So here I meet two pilots, a Spitfire Mark 9 this was? Yeah, it's the Mark 9. It was a squad of two, two Spitfires and I couldn't remember which one was which. So here I have an A675 Co below me and a Spitfire Mark 9. Now did you spot as I was fast forwarding it there what these guys were doing? They were engaging a P47 that was on the deck. And again, if we take a look, now the Zero's picked up some speed, but that's not too important. And the Spitfire is at about medium speed. This is where I'm going to use my advantage as best I can. Of course, I know the LA-7 quite well, so I know if I force that dive, I'm likely to either compress or potentially rip my wings off from overspeed. So I just pull back up into the vertical, because I know those guys can't get to me. And this, this will take you some time. This will take you some time to learn. So don't worry if you don't get it first time. This will take time. So then I dive down onto the Spitfire again after losing some energy. I commit to the turn. Fire a good burst and take him out of the sky for kill number two. Obviously I'm not going to show you the full battle. It's this bit that's important. And this is where I meet a zero. Flying by Canister89. Shout out the Bard Squad, by the way. That's a group I work with. And obviously, I'm keeping my speed very high. I kind of have to, because that's a zero. Now, of course, I know for a fact that at this moment in time, the zero can't catch me. Why do I know this? Well, for a start, zeros don't tend to climb at that fast a speed. They climb well, but they don't climb very fast. And obviously, this guy's engaging ground targets at a mere 225 miles an hour. Obviously, this will convert to your your own country's um, measurement system if you use it. I use feet and miles an hour, so there you go. But of course, this zero is engaging ground targets and isn't really paying too much attention to me at the moment. And this is what I'm going to use to my advantage. So using the speed that I built up in the dive as I went for him, I pull into the vertical, making sure to keep myself enough speed so I can accelerate and force the plane into a dive if the Zero happens to pull up for me. And obviously, here you can see the Zero is pulling up into the turn, but also going rather slow. Now unfortunately I missed my shot there, but again, I'm easily pulling away. Using the energy state that I have over him, because obviously I have the advantage right now, I'm able to force this into my favor. However, he does stick to me. But I'm a better shot. Now he is gonna put that fire out, but I'm still not gonna take any risks. Using the speed that I built up in that force head-on, because obviously I dodged the head-on, I'm gonna keep on going. Of course, the fire goes out. Using the speed that I built up, I turn back round. And this is where the Zero just tries to dodge me, but obviously he's low on speed, he's heavily damaged. And there he goes, kill number three. 
now we're going to skip ahead a bit more. Don't worry, this is the last part of this replay and the last part of this section. And this is where I'm going to meet a Spitfire Mark 5C Tropical. You may remember that Mark 9 from earlier. This is his squad name. Now, of course, a Spitfire Mark 5C isn't exactly the world's most amazing plane. But again, he's low on energy. How do I know this? Well, he's not pulling up for me. He's not dumb enough to do that. But this is where he really starts to commit into the dumbassery stage because he's pulling up when I have an energy advantage. So doing a climbing spiral, which is one of my favorite defensive maneuvers, I'm keeping an eye on the Spitfire as well as watching my airspeed. As you saw, I got rather low on speed there. I could have potentially stalled if I'd have kept going in that climb. So now the Spitfire pilot is attempting to regain its energy, but it's not gonna work for him. And there you go. That's kill number four for that match. I hope that gives you a rough idea of how energy state works and learning the enemy's energy state. So now we're gonna go into the next topic, which is capping runways. This may seem a bit unorthodox, but you'll be surprised at how much I see this. Let's go take a look, shall we? So now you join me on an infamous low tier map. This is Essen. Now, of course, you're not exactly going to be on this battlefield in a LA-7 anytime soon, but I'm using this map for an example because I see this the most. This also applies to maps like Korea. So as you can see down there, we have a runway. Obviously, it's under my control or my team's control at the moment, but this really applies if you're on the other side. You'll be surprised how many pilots I see that do this. Don't worry, we're going to be covering sort of, well, landing sort of tips and tricks later down the line. But don't worry, we'll cover that later. You'll be surprised at low tier how often I see this. Now, of course, this is under our control. So even though it's on the blue team, because that, that's what we all call it, so it's easier. Even though I'm on my team, you can't cap this runway if you're on the other side. Runways are not meant to be capped in Air RB. This is just going to line you up for something like that bot over there to have easy pickings. As a result, don't do this. Because all that's going to happen is you're going to get something like this. And of course, I could easily take off here, but I figure for the example, I'd let the bot have a couple of shots. You'll be surprised at how much I see this, and it's rather disappointing for me to actually have to bring this up. But unfortunately, I didn't really have a choice. So, now we're going to go back to the hangar, and we're going to take a look at something else that's also very important for aircraft. So now we're back in the hangar. The next topic is gun convergence and belts. Now, of course, for this example, I'm going to have to produce an aircraft that has wing-mounted guns. So, for an example, I'll just throw up this Su-6. So, as you'll notice on my LA-7, I have nose-mounted guns. Nose-mounted weaponry, this includes inside the prop hub, doesn't tend to rely on convergence all that much. As a result, setting convergence isn't really as important on these aircraft. So, even if you leave it on the highest convergence, 800 by the way, it's not a major deal in an aircraft like the LA-7. It's when it comes to aircraft like this. Of course, this applies to other fighters with wing-mounted guns as well. I'm just using the Su-6 because the Russians don't tend to have many wing-mounted weapons. Now, of course, this is very important because gun convergence is where your shots meet. Think of it like this. You're holding two pistols in either hand and you're pointing them at a target, obviously with the guns pointing at a slight angle so they'd hit the target that you're planning to hit in front of you. At some point in those bullets' trajectory, or trajectory I should say, those two bullets are going to meet. It's like parallel lines. Parallel lines will always meet at some point. Well, apparently. That's, that's what some people say. And as a result, you have to make sure your guns converge at a certain point. Each aircraft will have weapons that will work at certain distances. For example, US aircraft tend to work at around 600 meters. 
German aircraft tend to be about the same, although I'd actually recommend 500 meters for some of the German planes. Russian planes don't really tend to have convergence issues. However, you tend to have, I'd say, 400 meters to 500 meters for most Russian aircraft. Britain, definitely 400 meters. Japan, definitely 400 meters. China is a random mix of all the nations, so, well, apart from these three. But you get the point. That still applies. You'll have to learn which specific aircraft are in that tech tree, because obviously China is just full of different copy paste vehicles, so that will apply differently. Italy is pretty much like Germany. However, in the early stages, they're very much like Japan. So gun convergence is going to be important to be, I'd say, 400 for the early tiers and around 500 to 600 for the later tiers. France tends to be a mixed bag, and obviously it does include a lot of US vehicles. So 500 to 600 meter convergence for most of the French aircraft, not all, will work just fine. And Sweden? We don't talk about Sweden. You could run any convergence you like and you'll still nuke anything for the most part. Learning gun convergence is very important. Obviously, as you can see on this SU-6, we have two massive autocannons. These have a lot of spread, and these are very important for taking up ground targets. As a result, you're going to have to learn the best comfortable distance that you think is for working for you, and most importantly, the penetration values of your weapons. Because obviously in ground force, not ground, well not just ground force, I should really say, in the RRB, there are vital targets for you to take out, such as medium tanks, light tanks, and light pillboxes. Obviously there is a lot more, but we're not going to cover everything today, as I've already stated. As a result, you're going to have to find out what penetration angles and penetration, shall we say, values will work at certain ranges for your weapons. Typically in SU-6s, I run around 500 to 400 meters convergence for my 37 millimeters to meet. This is because 400 meters provides a good penetration value, and you are easily able to slice through the medium tanks and the light pillboxes on the maps. Now we're going to get into the next part. Belts. This applies to both offensive and defensive weapons. This should really be defensive in my opinion, not just turret, because not everything is a turret. Now of course, each weapon has its own classification. Anything up to a 15, or well, before a 15mm round is classed as a machine gun. So, for example, the Russian 14.5 heavy machine gun is still a machine gun, but the second you hit 15mm, it is officially classed as a cannon. For an example of this, if I just switch to Germany, we have a... where is it? It's the F2. As you can see, 15mm MG151 cannon. And then if we go to a Russian ground vehicle, such as the BTR... 152A, this is a 14.5mm, so this is a heavy machine gun, albeit a very heavy machine gun. Of course, learning gun classifications isn't as important, it's learning what the bullets are and shells, obviously, if they're cannon, and how they work. Of course, this may be something that isn't as important to some, so I'm not going to cover each individual ammo type in this video because I'll be here all day. But for the most part, we're just going to use the SU-6 since it has a wide range of different weaponry styles and different options. And overall, I'm just going to cover these because it's quicker. So for larger cannons, like these 37mm, you typically want to run the ground target belts. Now of course, if you're in a fighter, you primarily want to run air targets. Now of course, not many aircraft tend to pack cannons that are bigger than 20 or 30mm. However, some aircraft like the Russian Yak-9T and Yak-9K do. So learning which belts work on those aircraft, obviously the Yak-9K does not gain access to belts, but the point is still relevant. Learning what belts work best in which, or which gun is very important. And of course, your light caliber weapons will vary from nation to nation. This will also apply to the heavier cannons. The largest aircraft cannon in the game at the moment is the 102mm found on the P-108A. However, that sucks, but we're still going to use that for a point. Each nation will have different belts for different cannons, as we'll go into later. 
But as you can see, this Russian 7.62 has a wide range of different belts. Now, of course, you will start off with default, which don't tend to work very well. As a result, this will probably be quite hard to get kills with in the early stages of the game. Obviously, you won't have access to an SU-6 straight off the bat, but I'm using it for this example. It may take some getting used to, and also learning about your gun jamming will be something we'll cover later in the temperatures part of this. As a result, it really is down to finding out what works and what doesn't. If you're ever struggling with a belt, feel free to leave a comment below or any of my future videos and I will tell you which belts to run on certain aircraft. But of course, it's really down to what you want to run. If you think this belt works for you, use it. There's no harm in trying. If it doesn't work for you after a couple of tries, try something else. Then of course we go into the defensive side of belts. Now you'll notice in the majority of cases, the defensive mounted weaponry have different belts to your normal offensive weaponry. I'm not really sure why this is the case, but I'm guessing it's because Gaijin just want to make it a little bit different. As a result, each individual aircraft will have its own belts that you can choose from in its defensive state. For example, we have a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on the back of this SU-6. We have access to default, armoured and universal. Typically you want to go with something that has the most incendiary value. For example, the APIT and API belt in this, uh, in this 12.7. As a result, it's really learning what belts work best for you and what belts work best for your gunners on bombers, ground attackers and sometimes even heavy fighters if applicable. Then of course we have the slightly smaller cannons of the 23mm cartridge and the Russians are quite unique in the fact that they're I think they're the only nation that actually use 23mm excluding China because obviously they have Russian aircraft. But again you'll look at the penetration value and you may think hmm these are meant to be used against tanks and you'd be correct. However, these are very capable against aircraft. And personally, I'd even run armor targets on these. Purely because of the penetrating power, we'll be able to go through most aircraft quite comfortably and score you kills and or pilot snipes that you may want to get as you're going into a head-on pass. Of course, there's a lot to cover in terms of belts. Each individual nation has its own specific belt with its own specific setup. Obviously, Italy and Germany pretty much share the same belts and stuff like that. But typically, it's all about learning. If we compare to what we've just seen of the um, offensive machine guns in the SU-6 and stuff like that, you'll notice that the planes of different nations will have different belt styles. They'll have a mix of different ammunition types, such as armor piercing incendiary, armor piercing incendiary tracer, incendiary, and other weaponry, or other belt types, or bullet types, I should say, like that. As a result, it's really learning what bullets work best and which ones to avoid in your belts. And as a result, it's really down to experimentation. Now then. We're going to go into one of the most important parts about ARB crew skills. So for this example, I'm going to use this P-47. Now, this does apply to Air Arcade as well, but not as much. So in Air Arcade, you obviously have stuff like stamina and G tolerance. However, it is much less severe in that. And as a result, this will require some knowledge, but don't worry, I'll walk you through it as basic as I can because I don't want to make this video too long. So each individual part of the crew skills has its own purpose. So we're going to cover the pilot first. The pilot has access to five, keen vision. This allows him to detect, well, obviously we're going to assume all pilots are he is just because obviously in War Thunder and in real life, you can call your pilot whatever you like. So yeah and obviously there are female pilots in real life so guys you just haven't modeled any in as far as i know i think there's some on the japanese helicopter premium but for the most part your your pilot is going to be a male anyway so looking at the parameters there you can see obviously i've got maxed out crew on this p47 you can see there's different parameters and there's based parameters 
As you can see there, there's air to air missile, line of sight, detection range against the sun, look down detection range, and air to air missile launch detection range. Obviously, I have a pretty much maxed out crew, minus the ace crew. And my crew skills are much higher than what yours would be if you are a new player, slash transfer into RRB and you have low crew skills. As you can see here, the base skill is two for well, two miles for the air to air, well, sorry, two seconds, I should say, for the air to air missile launch detection delay. Obviously, you won't need this till you get into the higher tier. But line of sight detection range, base is 2.36 miles. But my crew allows me to detect a target at 4.25 miles. This is a huge benefit and really helps in the long run. Obviously, I'm not going to cover everything about Keen Vision because most of it is missiles, but detection range against the sun is if an aircraft is coming down from you from the angle of the sun. And the look down detection range is if you're looking down on an aircraft that's at ground level and you're able to detect it. Obviously, I'm able to detect one at 1.06 miles. You would only be able to detect it if your base crew skill was zero at just over half a mile. Awareness. Absolute identification. This is pretty much the same as keen vision. However, this allows you to absolutely identify an aircraft at a certain distance. Obviously, this is measured in feet for some reason. I don't know why it is because I have it set to miles. But um, your base would be a lot lower than the top and or mine at this current stage of the time. Depending on your crew skills, of course. As a result... This is important because you don't know if it could be a specific model of an aircraft that you might be fighting or a specific aircraft that you might not have seen before. So this is important because maybe you could learn something about that aircraft by going to the other nations, as I said before, and learning each individual aircraft. Next up, we have G tolerance. Probably one of the most important in RRP, to be brutally honest, and yeah this is very important as you can see there we have a base of five that means the peak g tolerance that your pilot can take is five so your pilot will be able to pull 5g turns pretty much comfortably within reason of course however as you can see mine is 6.5 so i could pull a little bit tighter for longer so to speak as a result, you might find yourself blacking out a lot in the early stages. Now, negative G works a little bit differently. Peak G is positive, so in other words, when you're pulling a tight turn. Negative G is when you're pushing your aircraft down. So in other words, pushing the stick forward to increase in a dive. This is important because I see a lot of pilots redding out, as it's called. Positive G is where you black out. Negative G is where you've read out. This is a lot to learn, and it's really about getting your crew skills into the point where you don't have to worry about this anymore, or at least very little. As you can see, the base is negative 1.7 G. The way red out works is the blood is actually pushed away from your eyes. So in other words, you will just see red, because obviously it's obstructing your vision. As a result, your pilot will very easily read out in negative G maneuvers. So using those carefully is key, but there's a trick to it to avoid negative G entirely. Next, we have stamina. This affects accuracy, well, this mostly affects accuracy in gunners, but also G tolerance. And it also has an effect on aiming accuracy in mouse aiming mode. The way stamina works is think about it like this. You're pulling a sharp turn and your pilot is close to blacking out. You then level out after completing the turn that you needed to do, and your pilot's vision returns to normal. That is stamina. Obviously, G tolerance takes a lot out on a person. I can't say I've ever been into G tolerance myself, but it does take a lot out of you, as far as I've been able to know. If there's any ex-Air Force pilots or anything like that in my comments, please do, or like ex-military that have experienced G tolerance, Please put it in the comments below to explain it a little more in depth, because obviously I don't know. I've not served. But this is very important. Keeping your pilot's stamina about the same level as your G tolerance will make a massive difference. And of course, we have vitality. 
this I really shouldn't need to cover. The pilot is the most important part of the aircraft. If you lose your pilot, well, your aircraft's done for. You you can't fight back once your pilot is dead. Well, I say dead. In this game, it's unconscious, but I'm just being brutally honest here. As a result, keeping your vitality quite well is very important, because sometimes you might not get killed by the first bullet that enters your cockpit and hits your pilot. There's a really good way to show this, and I'll do that in a moment. But... This is key to learning about your pilot. At the end of the day, think about it as your, as your pilot as a human. This is the best way to think about it. If you take a bullet to the leg, chances are you're going to bloody feel it. And as a result, it is really down to what the pilot is able to take. Think about a person. And as you can see in the game, it's describing second 303 from MG15 or similar. Obviously, it's a different caliber. But it's usually fatal depending on where it hits. But, as you can see there, with a measure of luck, can survive even one hit from a 50 caliber machine gun. If we just close down the crew skills, and I'll come back to it very shortly, you can press on the armor tab, and press on protection analysis. You then need to locate where your pilot is in the aircraft, for example, right here in the P-47, and pull a bullet right there. Now, of course, because of the location where the pilot was hit, that would render my pilot unconscious. But as you saw there, it hit him just underneath, near the pelvis. So my pilot was able to survive that bullet. See what I mean? Measure of luck. It's really down to luck if your pilot is going to make it through a bullet or not. So now we'll go back to cruise skills and we'll take a look at gunners, aka defensive armament. <coughs> Excuse me, this is taking a lot of my throat, so I do apologise. So, here we have number of experienced gunners. Now, of course, the P-47 doesn't have any gunners. I'd be a bit worried if it did. So, for this example, we're going to pull up a twin-engined ground attacker, such as my A-26, which I just happen to have right here. If we go to this, obviously it's a far different crew than what you saw earlier. You'll notice that my gunnery skills are maxed out, but of course, the number of firing points of defensive armament is one, because there's only one gunner on board at this aircraft. As a result, this makes my aircraft a lot better in the long run. Sorry if you heard that. Um, this makes my aircraft a lot more dependent on the gunner, because I don't have to control them as much. I still take manual control anyway, because you can do that, but... It's just the best way to get around it. Having maxed out crew points in this, obviously the top is 10, because obviously there is a maximum of 10 gunners on one aircraft. <coughs> Excuse me. And as a result, it really is vital to keep these in check. Obviously, I only have one gunner on this aircraft. Some aircraft may have multiple. Some aircraft may have five or six gunners. It really depends. Now these next skills are going to apply to the gunners themselves. Fire accuracy is the gunner's fire. Obviously, if they're G-locked or they're passing out or something like that, they're not going to be able to shoot very well, and their accuracy is going to be a bit less, shall we say, not as important, and they won't be hitting as often. It's been long since argued that the War Thunder Gunners are terrible, which I do admit they are. They are pretty crap, in my personal opinion. Fair enough, this is on an unskilled crew, but, well, a relatively unskilled crew, but still. And, obviously, precision is scattering, so think about it like this. You're holding, you're in a gunner position on a B-17, you're holding the 50 cal. You're firing the weapon, and, obviously, the recoil is making you shake. Think about it like that. Precision is pretty much like that. Precision is where your gunner can actually shoot and hit the target quite well. Of course, the better your gunner is at taking the recoil and the scattering, the more chances that you're not, well, your gunner is going to hit the target better. G tolerance, stamina, and vitality are the same as the pilot. Next up, logistical services. This applies to your aircraft. This does not apply to your pilot or gunners. Repair speed. When you're on the runway, repair quicker. And also, if you're in the hangar and you're waiting on free repairs, because you can do that, 
if we just take a look at this A26, it should say, where is it? Uh, here it is. Free repair time with crew is two days and 17 hours. So if you want to be a cheapskate, like a really bad cheapskate, like make me look like I'm some sort of... Well, let's put it this way. I'm quite the cheapskating game. But even I'm not that cheap. Free repair time of this aircraft with crew is two days and 17 hours. So for two days, 17 hours after this aircraft is shot down, you will not be able to play it. If, of course, you turn off free repairs. Well, auto repair. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm terribly sorry. And as a result, you're going to have to wait. But increasing this repair speed is going to make it a lot less. As you can tell there, one day, seven hours is the top. That's actually rather quick. Next up, repair rank. Obviously, there are seven ranks in this game. And the top rank is 7, because obviously we have stuff like F4 Phantoms. If I was to put a crew point here, I would have access to repair my rank 7 jets much quicker. Reload speed. Reloading on the runway. Now, of course, this does apply to Air, RB, well, Air AB as well. But remember, in Air RB, your guns do not reload in mid-flight. This isn't something that happens. I wish it did, unless, you, unless you've got a gunner which reloads. As a result, this is something that you're going to need to learn. Your gunners will reload automatically. It will take some time for them to do that. But in the long run, it will be something you need to learn. Just going to take a drink, one second. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I don't do these, do these long videos very much, so it does take a toll on my throat. I do apologize. Anyway, so as you can see there, gun in air reload time. This is all for AB, apart from gunner in air reload time and on air fuel reload time. As a result, the quicker you can reload your guns on your gunners and on the airfield, the quicker you can get back into the fight and possibly defend yourself from the incoming aircraft. And finally, we have Weapon Maintenance, the armor skill. This will reduce the chance of your weapons jamming and the bomb scattering at 1,000 meters. So in other words, your bombs will be more accurate, more depending on, shall we say, where your aircraft is dropping them from. So if you drop them from 1,000 feet, the, low the lowest scattering distance is 57 feet, which is not a lot. As a result, you'll hit your targets much more often with weapon maintenance maxed out. Finally, we have qualifications. This can cost an arm and a leg, so just bear that in mind, depending on the aircraft. For example, I can pay 150,000 SL, which is nothing to me, but you get the idea, for a expert crew of my A26. This makes my crew better. But then, you can play either the aircraft a lot of times, or you can pay for it to get an ace crew. This will also further boost your aircraft's capability. So, it's really down to you. If you want to pay the extra SL to have a better crew, go right ahead. I, I would say do it. So, <coughs> terribly sorry. I, I can't help this cough. We're now going to go into the in-game tutorials. So, let's take a quick look. They are here. So, typically at the start of War Thunder, you would only have to play a first few couple, such as Fighter Control Basics, Attacker, Bomber, and Takeoff and Landing. This one you have to do to take off in air, well, you have to do it to play RB. Make sure this one is done. Of course, the tank stuff and the motorboat and destroyer, these, these are not important. But then, we have these. Takeoff and basic flight controls. Aerial combat and landing. Carrier takeoff and torpedoing. Dive bombing and carrier landing. Of course... These are done in real well these are done in arcade settings. However, I believe you can do them if I just press yes you can do them in realistic. So if you want to challenge yourself, 
Try doing the dive bomber and carrier landing in realistic. Try to do the others in realistic if you can. These will make a huge benefit, and I, I cannot stress this enough. This is how I got so good with me dive bombing. I did stuff like this back in the day. And it's so important. Anyway, we're now going to go into the next few things, and we're going to use the LA-7 for this one again. And as a result, we're going to need to do another cut. But that also gives me a time to rest my throat a little bit. So we're going to be covering temperatures, climb angles, extreme overloads, landing safely, and changing loadout on the runway. I'll see you all in a minute. So you join me back in the LA-7, and again we're on the Essen map, just because it's easier to do it this way. So, before I take off, we need to discuss the climb angles part. Climb angles is how your aircraft climbs. Each aircraft will be able to do a certain climb angle better than others. So, let's get into the air and I can explain this a little bit more. Now, of course, each individual aircraft has its own takeoff speed, its own acceleration on the runway, and you can use flaps like this to take off easier, but I don't recommend doing that. I just wait until your aircraft gains enough speed so where you can just comfortably lift off with just a slight move of your mass. So, there is a way to actually check your aircraft's climb angle. So if you use V, which is on your keybinds, which will cover keybinds shortly, keybinds can be used to enter the cockpit, which isn't really important. But if we press V again, we see this. This is the climb angle. Now, of course, I know some people are going to jump in the comments saying that you just use airspeed as your indicator. You don't need climb angle. Yeah, but this is for people who are transitioning to aerobe. They may not understand that. So, instead, I'm going to show you what I find to be the best in this LA-7. And obviously, this can be experimented on in your own time for specific aircraft. So as you can tell, I've put the aircraft into a roughly 17 degree climb, and I've started to web. And as you can tell, the aircraft is climbing quite comfortably. As a result, this is something you need to know, because at the same time, learning what angle your aircraft climbs best at is key to getting into position early in certain matches. Next up, we're going to cover temperatures. So if we just pause it here and go into the options, I'm now going to go into the air battle settings, no, the measurement units. And first of all, the most important thing, set it to something you prefer with. For example, temperature may be done in degrees Celsius, or if you're in a country that uses degrees Fahrenheit, set it to that. Climb speed can, well, climb speed can be done in meters per second or feet per minute. Distance can be measured in kilometers, feet, mile, or feet, mild, uh, I don't know why I said feet, or yards. Altitude can be measured in feet or meters, and speed can be measured in knots, miles per hour, or kilometers an hour. If we then go to the battle interface, you can have fuel indication, which is important, because trust me, Derp Angel knows about this, and set it to always. Same with the, am or the ammunition indicator and the temperature indicator. Self-explanatory. So let's cover it a little bit more. Now I've got my aircraft to a little bit of altitude, so as you can tell, my aircraft temperatures are pretty well safe. I'm at 88 degrees Celsius for my oil, and I'm about 220 to 230 for my engine. This is safe for the LA-7. It is perfectly fine, and obviously each individual aircraft will have its own temperatures, and what you need to learn to counter it. For the most part, if you just do this, and throttle back to around about 80 to 50% on most aircraft. Chances are your radiators are going to open, like in the LA-7 here, and you can cool your aircraft down quite well. And as you can see, the temperatures are starting to drop on the engine. But of course, if you're wet for too long, which at this altitude the LA-7 struggles to wet, it does overheat after a while, so you have to watch your temperatures. This also applies to your guns. If I just fire my guns, Did you see that? Watch the cursor again. There was a red mark on, on there, wasn't there? 
That indicates whenever your aircraft's guns are about to overheat. If I just fire the whole thing, hopefully I don't run out of ammo for this, but... Notice how the cannon, well the indicator went four circles around, well four parts around the red circle, and then started to flash. When it's flashing, that means your guns are close to jamming. And as you saw there, one of my cannons jammed with a bullet still in the chamber. I'll do that again. And watch. As each gun overheats, it starts to shut down and jam. Learning when your aircraft's guns overheat can make the difference between you making yourself look like an ass because you sprayed too much, and most importantly, you can also make your aircraft not as, shall we say, vulnerable on the way back to base if you have jammed guns. So next up, we have extreme overloads. So if I put my LA-7 into a dive, you'll notice it said there, overload 6G. However, if I put my LA-7 into a steep pull-up, like this, I'll get 11G. Now in some aircraft, because the LA-7 has quite good wings, you will get what's called a extreme overload. Extreme overload is where your aircraft's wings are unable to take the forces of the turn. So if I just do that again, hopefully I can get a extreme overload. I don't think I can in an LA-7. I've never ripped wings off one of these, so that should give me an indication. No, I can't seem to do it in an LA-7, but best example is a Spitfire. Typically, a Spitfire will start to turn, and at around the 8G to 9G mark, you'll get an extreme overload warning. It is heavily recommended to stop turning because your aircraft will rip itself apart eventually. So learning your extreme overloads is very vital. The last thing, and conveniently we have the runway from earlier, we have landing safely. But of course, we're not going to be going there, we're going to be going to the main airfield. And this is where we're going to cover two other topics. Landing safely and changing loadout on the runway. Now of course, each individual aircraft has its own landing speed. This is something you're going to have to learn. And if I prove an example by popping the flaps here, you'll notice that my LA-7's flaps have come off. This happens. Unlike an air arcade where you can drop the flaps at like 700 miles an hour, you can't do that. So, learning when your aircraft's flaps will rip off is very important because having flaps when you're landing makes things a lot easier. But I've deliberately ripped the flaps off to showcase that. So as you can see, we're coming in at 380 to 360 miles an hour. That is way too fast. Each aircraft has its own gear rip speed, flap rip speed, and things like that. This is something I recommend you experiment in your own time. But of course, I know the LA-7's landing speed, so I don't need the flaps, and I know when to drop the gear. So the key to doing this is to keep a little bit of throttle, to make sure you don't make yourself look like an ass and crash into a tree. Then as you come in, start reducing the throttle a little bit further, drop your landing gear with your key bind, which should be auto set to G, and bring the aircraft nice and slowly in, avoiding any trees, because you do not want any squirrels. And bring the aircraft nice and gently, as you come down to the runway. Make sure to hold S as you come down, and your wheels touch the ground to initiate braking. If you have any ammunition left, sorry if you heard that, you can use your cannon, or machine gun, to help slow down. Then, we pull safely to a stop. That's the easiest way to land, and the quickest way to land safely if you have no flaps. Just learn your gear rip speed, and this will be so much easier. So now we're going to cover changing loadout on the runway, this one's rather quick. So now that I've fully rearmed and repaired on the runway, this is important, you must do this first. You must wait until your aircraft is fully rearmed, repaired and refueled. You can then either hold J for 3 seconds on the runway, or you can press escape and press leave the plane. This will then allow you to exit your aircraft 
change any loadout by strapping bombs, changing belts, changing fuel, changing gun convergence, or if you really want to, you can change your grey, well, your camouflage from a grey blue camouflage to the standard LA7 colour. You can do that. Then once you're ready, press 2 battle again, and you'll spawn right where you left off with the new things added to your aircraft. So, we're now going to cover key binds as I sit here on the run. I'm just going to turn the engine off for the moment, because we don't need it yet. Because there's one final thing we need to cover before we go into the main topic of what I see people struggling with in ARB. So, let's go to controls. Now, of course, there's a lot to cover here, but yeah, I'm not going to cover everything. So you have movement, such as throttle axis, but that's more for, shall we say, roll axis and stuff like that. This is more for joysticks. And of course, you have mechanization. You can have boosters, you can toggle your flaps, you can have a keybind set to toggle your flaps as well. However, I don't use these, so I set them to a key I don't use. You then have air brake. This should be set by default. Same with gear. And of course, you can also use a drag chute if you wish on a higher tier jet. You then have your weaponry controls. Small caliber guns, large caliber guns, additional guns, etc. You then have fire primary weapons, which I think this is something different. I've never used this. This appears to be just similar. You then have Bombay door, which I recommend setting to B, because then you can open your Bombay door, drop your bombs, and then shut your Bombay door and causes little drag and or speed loss to your aircraft. You then have drop bomb, which should be also set to space. But of course, if you do not have your bomb bay doors open, because unlike A, B, you have to do that, this this will just take longer, and it's really recommended to not do that. You then have rockets, rocket salvo, fire air to ground missile, and stuff like that. There's a lot to cover here. I'm not going to cover everything, of course. You then can have your gunners to turn off if you're maybe flying in formation with someone. And of course, you can have camera controls and things like that. This is something I recommend you do in your own time. Aerobatic smoke, you can set to your own. You can turn off the instructor, which I heavily recommend you do, such as auto control on landing gear, flaps and engine. And of course, auto restricts control of the aircraft near the ground. This is all rest stuff that I recommend you turn off. You then have manual engine control to toggle prop feather in and toggle the engine off. That's how I was able to turn my aircraft's engine off. I set it to I and turn the aircraft off. Because it's just easier that way. So, let's get back into the air and let's go have a look at one of the final things before we get into, shall we say, the most important part, which I see a lot of people struggle with. So let's get up into the air. Now I know what you're thinking. Why is my aircraft not moving like this whenever I'm looking round? Well, there's a short answer for that. A keybind. I have a keybind set to the free camera at C. And now I can comfortably move around without my aircraft going out of control. And easily, I can look around and maintain one of the most important things I see new players lack. Situational awareness. Now, of course, I know that there's multiple different aircraft over there because they are spotted by my teammate bots. So think about it this way. Imagine this. You're coming in for a landing and there's an enemy aircraft in the area that you know about, but you're not quite sure where he is. On landing approach, such as this, you may be coming in nice and slow and you may be vulnerable. Take a look around. Is there anything around? No? Well, then you're safe to land. If there's something... Oh no, there's an aircraft behind me. You could just quickly throttle up, put your gear in, put your flaps in, and off you go. And then you can start to maneuver if necessary. That is something that a lot of people miss, and I really recommend doing that sort of thing. So, let's go back to the hangar, and let's discuss one final thing about... Air RB, which is different from Air AB. And for that, we need to go into the research and look at this. So this normally is something I don't tend to cover, but this is very important. If you notice, if I switch to aviation, and you'll notice some of the BRs have changed from what you saw earlier on. 
Potentially, of course. Yeah, this is important. In ARB, different battle ratings apply to different aircraft. As we can see, in arcade, the X7B is battle rating 3.3. And it has different performance data from what we would know in aerialistic. But if we switch it to realistic, you'll notice a lot of the BRs just changed there. The Chica went up to 2.0, for example. The X7B dropped to 2.3, and its performance data has changed. This is very important. Learning what you will fight and what you won't fight is very key to understanding different sort of scenarios. You could be flying in a I-16, for example, and you could be flying alongside a Yak, which you may think you might not fight alongside in Air AB. Learning that is so key to getting into the game in realistic, it's unbelievable. You will learn so much by just looking at the different BRs and learning what you can and won't fight in each individual nation. So other than the coughs, because obviously I'm not used to doing videos this long, I hope that has helped you out NERB 2007. I'm sorry for it being a little long because it's been a really long video to plan and to be brutally honest I'll stump for a bit but yeah this is certainly something that I would like to do again so if you do want me to do a bit more advanced stuff I will certainly do that for you but anyway I've kept you all for too long I think I don't know how long the video has been running right now but I will certainly check and I'll try and edit it down as as much as I can and um, I hope you enjoyed today's little shall we say guide into ARB tips and tricks and stuff like that and if you want to see more please do let me know and I will get around to it just bear in mind I might not be able to do videos as long as you think because of my throat but anyway I'll see you all on the next one